Right, let's just open up in prayer. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to come together in your name and discuss your word. Help us to understand your word and help us to interpret that within our time period and also within the prophetic timeline so we can glean the the wisdom from your scripture and apply it to our lives in a practical way. Ask in all the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. All righty. Welcome, everyone. Um, so this is our lockdown attempt in meeting. It's, it's not my favorite, but unfortunately it is what it is. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm leaving the, the microphones on. So if you want to make a comment, please do so. And then we can have a, a chat or discussion, whatever, as per normal. So we can keep this two-way communication going. I'm just minimizing the camera, otherwise I can't see the whole screen. All right, so kicking off. So we are doing a double Torah portion, which is Shoftim and Kitizay, which is judges and when you go out. Uh, What I want to emphasize is um, the next Torah portion next week um, is about um, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerzim. And the Torah portion prior to Shoftim was about Mount Gibel, uh, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. So we have sort of a symmetrical situation, which I think definitely fits on a menorah pattern. Um, just to give a quick overview within this Torah portion, we'll look at two kings. We're also going to look at two wars. And they're all packaged in within the Torah portion, Kitizay, which start with the theme of war, end with the theme of war. So now we have this menorah pattern, and inside this menorah pattern, we've got 72 commandments that sit within Kitizay. So Shoftim form part of this um, prophetic picture, um, which is about judges and leadership. So the main focus for this parasha is to pinpoint the time frame where we are prophetically, um, where Israel was historically, in the context of the judges, as well as in the context of uh, a, a war or a conflict that happens. Now, I mentioned earlier this week in my little snippet that war or conflict is a result of the two realms overlapping. We've got the realm of light and the realm of darkness are now coming into contact with one another. And as soon as you get that, you get the forces at play, just like you have a low pressure, high pressure um, uh, system that will then create strong winds and a strong wind blowing over the ocean, which is the nations, will start to create a storm. And the storm is a dangerous place where there's a lot of energy and, and forces at play. So we are now in the process, and I think the two realms already overlapped. With the things that we see um, in the world out there, there's definitely conflict, there's definitely oppression, and the softer word for war is the oppressor or the opposer. Um, so we're going to look at the opposing forces within the leadership of Yahweh, as well as within the religious realm, as well as within the political realm, and how those things start to play out as these two realms connect. Now, the reason they have to connect is to reestablish the neck that's between the head and the body. Now, the body is the physical, the head is the spiritual where Yahweh is. And the neck, which used to be the tabernacle, is now going to be reinstated in the form of the city. But prior to that, the two realms will connect and then the mobile tabernacle will be established through Yahweh's people. And after that period, the physical city will come down to establish that that fixed connection. So it's all coming together. I know it, it feels a bit unstable. There's a lot of confusion things happening. It's all just part of the process of these two forces, these two realms connecting, and we're in the thick of it. It's not that it's going to start, it already started. So that's where we're at. Um, just looking at the two Hebrew words, Shoftim, I've highlighted the letter Pei, letter Mem. Pei means mouth, and Mem means word. So that's a no-brainer. We have to speak the word. That's in context of judges. So the judge's job is to speak out his word. Uh, 
it is a, you'll know <clears throat> the Zion in the middle, which is sword, which is another term for the word. And that also links to Mount Cheref, which is the mountain of Cork, which is Mount Sinai, which is where Yahweh's words were spoken from. Now, on the two sides of the sword, you'll see the one holding the sword, and that is the Aleph Taf. So that's the Mashiach coming with the sword from his mouth, because he will be in his word. So that is uh, just a bit of a picture around the titles of these two Torah portions. All right. So anyone want to make a comment? All right. So let's move on. So covering a lot of real estate in the scriptures, we're not going to touch on any of that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I'm just going to give an overview and a highlight of this. Next year, yeah, we're willing, we'll delve into these commandments to give a, a bit more insight into what is happening. Um, I'm just going to set the framework up this year to see what the prophetic framework looks like and where we are currently. I'm not going to say too much about this. This is last week's just the Gematria on Yahweh your Elohim, how many times it's found in Scripture. The one that's relevant to us is the triple four. And we're going to briefly revisit just laying a bit more foundation, confirming this idea from another passage. And then we're also going to touch on number seven and the Mount Gilead, because Mount Gilead connects in that same verse that I'm going to look at um, into the same topic. Now, Mount Gilead, just to quickly recap, links to the people who have the fish as the symbol, which is our Christian brothers. And as you can see there with the Gematria of seven, the majority of the meanings are not positive. There's only um, a few positive words at the end, which I will overtop or I will overcome and rest. So that is the outcome of what Yahweh will do um, within this process that he's going to do. We also mentioned the idea of that we are currently in the wilderness cycle from creation. The first coming of Messiah to this point, we're still in the wilderness because we haven't reached the promised land yet from a, perspective, from a prophetic perspective. Now, there is going to be a second wilderness cycle that's going to happen in the beginning of the seventh millennium up to the end of the seventh and the starting of the eighth millennium. And thereafter, the city will come down. So, we're going to basically zoom in onto that seventh millennium in this parasha through the meanings that we're going to see. In, in relation to that. Mount Gilead is prominent there, and of course, we'll meet the people um, that's part of that, which is associated with the, the uh, tribe, which we looked at last time. Um, thinking back quickly to that, the, 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 the negative side of religion within Christianity or any religion is the, the, the idea of man-made traditions and things that come from um, humans or the way we want to worship Yahweh and then we make it rules and then everyone needs to conform to that to belong. Um, if it's not in the Torah, it's not supposed to be a commandment or a instruction how you're supposed to do it, then it's personal. I'm not taking away from any traditions. If you feel a tradition is good, then it's fine, but don't impose that on anyone else because it's personal. And you have to question yourself whether that tradition is in line with what Yahweh says, says in the scripture, or is it something that you're adding? So be very careful of adding to Yahweh's commandments. All right, so here we are, Book of Judges. Now I've highlighted that this parasha is right after the start of the month, the starting of the month of Elul. Now the month start with the new moon. Now we are currently between the new moon on our way to the full moon, which will be, I think, Sunday evening, or oh, it's Monday. Anyway, it's around there. So we are within the period of the starting of the month of Elul. Now, what's interesting about the, the word Elul, it means nothingness. And um, it's also a link to the, to the number 67, which means nothingness, worthlessness, ineffective, pride, arrogance, vile, insignificant. And then we get some action. 
um, to transform that um, worthlessness into something concrete, which is um, be light. <coughs> and that's another term for judging. And then grind is another term for refining. And crush is linked to what you do with grapes. And that's associated with the wine press. So what we see within the month of Elul is to prepare for the time that is coming, the time of judgment, the time of refinement, and the time of the wine press to take care of those who are still entwined with nothingness, worthlessness, ineffectiveness, pride, arrogance, and being ins ins insignificant in regards to our things. Now, as a result of that, the, the positive words are the belly. Now, belly of reptiles is linked to the center word of the Torah, which is the Rosh Terash. Or is it? Anyway, one of yeah, those no. words is linked. No, that's certainly searching the ram. There's another one that's just a single word in the middle, and that word is belly, and that word is right in the middle of the Torah. And that belly is the belly of a reptile. And that belly of a reptile here connects to the center or the heart of the Torah, which is in the center of Leviticus as well. So that points us right into the center of Yahweh's heart, the purpose of his scripture, and it's to transform us from being like, you know, um, a reptile encaged uh, being, because the serpent and the hush is basically the, the ruler over the, the reptiles. And we are now going to be set free from that. And that's where the book of the Torah. Mm -hmm. And then we get understanding discernment. We also see noble, famous leader and captain. That's basically what Shoftim is about. And to prostrate yourself and to worship. That's what we looked at the previous Torah portion. And that is what these leaders are supposed to do to be declared righteous leaders. And then we get the structure, the building of Yahweh has built uh, up and the building of Elohim, which is his house and my father is the judge. So what we see as a result of this grinding, refining process is to build up the house of Elohim. That's the goal of what we're going to look at the time of judgment, which extends right through the seventh millennium as well. Now, as you can see from the festival pattern, we are in month six. We left, this is on this wheel here. So we left Egypt during the spring festivals, which is the first feast. And then we moved to Shavuot, which is the fourth month. Um, that's the mountain experience. And now we are moving into month six, which is the month of preparation for entering the time of judgment. That's why the month of Elul is so important. And we saw that within the gematria of the word Elul. Now, what's also interesting is that Elul is uh, an acronym of the verse that is found in the Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3, which is the phrase, Ani Hedodi Vedodi Li, which means, I am my beloved and my beloved's mine. So Elul is the acronym for that Hebrew phrase. And when you dissect the books of Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, you'll see he wrote three books. The one he wrote in the physical form or relates to the body, that's the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, that is all about everything's under the sun and everything's just a, a waste. Um, the, the next one is written for the soul. That's the book of Proverbs. And the spiritual one is the Song of Solomon. And that is written for the spirit. Now, when you read the Song of Solomon, it's all about language between a bride and her groom or her beloved. And that's the language, the spiritual language of Yahweh reuniting us through his covenant. And that's the preparation that needs to take place during the month of Elul, because the seventh month is all about the groom come and collecting his bride, and she needs to be prepared. So this month is a prophetic reminder for us that we need to cleanse ourselves. We need to get our garments ready. We need to beautify ourselves as, as his bride because he is coming. Sipotis on the tray. And that's part of the theme of Sipot as yeah. well. Yeah. All right. Any comments on that? Anyone? Righty. So this uh, parasha kicks off with Deuteronomy 16 verse 18. 
appoint judges and officers for your tribes in every city. And then it says in verse 20, strive for nothing but justice so that you will live and take possession of the land that Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. The word judges or shoftim is a singular word, um, a singular of the, uh, it's the plural of the singular word shafat that means to govern or to rule. Now, Shafat has the gematria of 389, that means to be insensitive, to be fat, to strip, to invade, to raid, flood, downpour, engulf, to judge, punish, and judgment. So we see the same language that we found within the gematria of 67, which is the gematria of Elo, which has to do to be light, to be weight, that's judgment, to be crying, that's refined, and to be crushed. And that crushing or the engulfment or the flood has to do with the forces of the two realms now engulfing one another and the conflict or the forces at play are now evident in our midst. Now, as a result of that process, we'll see um, govern, vindicate, to wash, to rinse, dominion, the sovereignty of uh, my father, uh, my father is safety, and my father is peace. So the outcome of this whole process of being led by a judge is to lead you into the father's peace and into the father's safety and to be governed by them in the process of being washed and cleansed. So what are, am I saying about this? In the context of the six months, the month of Elul, the month of preparation, is that Yahweh will start to raise judges up during our time in order to govern his people during a time of preparation prior to his coming. And at the time of preparation precedes what I call um, the crossing of the Jordan, the great birth, and in this context, the, one of the first wars that will happen that will end in, in the war of Armageddon. So all of this is now in preparation for the bride, but as well as for his soldiers, his army that need to be ready to enter into that time to take possession of the land and to take care of the enemies and to remove them from the land. So that's the, the whole context of the preparation that we are in. So what do we need to do to prepare? So we're gonna to touch on that a bit later on when we look uh, a bit more on the spiritual warfare aspect. That, had, that relates to the letter pay within the work for judges. So what we need to find now is find out whether you are a ruler that like Yahweh is calling, or you need to find one that's righteous, as <laughs> if you can be led by them, because there's many false ones. Um, the false ones are associated with the word arrogant, worthless, vile, insensitive, and greedy. And they are the evil judges that are amongst us that will lead Yahweh's people astray. Now, within the context of the book of Judges, we've, we found a couple of different judges that relates to each one of those. All right, so Elul, according to the pattern of the festivals, is also the process for coming into the kingdom. Now, we need to be sensitive about that because we, as part of the kingdom of priests, we need to be the laborers within the time of the harvest. And we need to take people through the cycle of coming into the kingdom by leaving Egypt or leaving sin and bondage. And then we need to bring them to the mountain. They need to hear the word of Yahweh so that they can cleanse themselves and prepare themselves so that they can move through their little experience and also be ready during the time of judgment to be part of the bride. So we are in that time where there's conflict, where people will ask questions. So when that happens, we've got an opportunity to answer them with the right information. So that's part of being a judge is to have the right answer within the context of what's happening around us and bring it into a prophetic um, significant um, answer so that they can make the connection and realize that the time is near for the uh, King Messiah coming. All right, so the phrase within Deuteronomy 17, 14, 
It's the next verse I want to look at where it says, you will come unto the land which Yahweh, your Elohim, gives you and shall possess it and dwell therein and shall say, I will set a king over me like as the nations that are about me. So this is basically the starting point that is described in detail in the book of Judges. Israel looked around them, what the nations are doing. Oh, they've got a king. I think we need a king as well. Even though Yahweh had a Moses and a Joshua leading them, they still long for someone like a king because the nations got one. So Yahweh allowed that, but that didn't end out very well. So we're going to look a bit in, a, in the next slide about the cycle of the judges. But before we go in there, I just want to elaborate a bit on the phrase and dwell therein. That's about possessing the land. But when you look at the, the phrase and dwell therein, it's actually one word. That's the word vayash ta. Um, that means when you sit. Now, this is grammatically or according to Hebrew uh, misspelled because the hay was added to that word. Now, looking back through the, the, the Torah um, up to the point of Abraham, we saw the first hay. Well, actually, prior to that, let there be light is the letter hay. And then Abraham received the light or the hay in his name. Sarah received the same hay in the name. And the hay is basically the anointing or the ability that Yahweh is giving his people in order that they can possess the land and dwell therein. It can only be done through following anointed leaders. And they will help you to overcome the enemies within that land. And it's done by the help of his spirit. So that's a bit of wisdom that we can glean from that phrase within the Torah portion. Now, when you shuffle the, the letters of that same word, you get the word behishbati, um, that is first found in the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, verse uh, 6. That means, I will cause to rest, which is another term for Shabbat. And this is in context of Israel entering the promised land, entering Yahweh's peace, but they also mention the animals like the lion and the lamb that lays together, which is a term that's used to connect back to the Garden of Eden. So now entering the land is prophetically pointing back to the original intent of Yahweh's creating, creation of man and placing man within the garden and then dwelling with man inside the garden. So entering the land, the promised land, now have a link back to the restoration of the Garden of Eden through this phrase. Now, what we also see in this verse is that there is a king associated with this whole picture. Now, we're going to look um, through the book of Judges, the idea of two kings. The one is the first king or the counterfeit king, and then the real king. And those two kings will be standing between you and the Garden of Eden. You have to face the first king uh, first, and then you'll face the second king. And we're going to see what that means from a prophetic perspective. Any comments, anyone? All righty, Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. So still the same verse. <laughs> appoint, your, appoint judges and officers. We're just going to look at the two words for judge and for officer. Judge is the word shafat, and it means to govern and to rule. Officer or leader is the word soter, that means leader, officer, and to write. Now, what's interesting when I saw these two words, I saw that they share... Two letters, the letter Shin in Shafat and the letter Tet, which is the first and last letter. And so there has got the Shin and the Tet in there as well. And the two letters that are different is the letters Pei and Resh. So just looking at those words and putting them together and their meanings give us a bit more insight about judges, officers, and leaders. So what does the Shin represent? The shin represents Yahweh's spirit, Yahweh's anointing. What does the tet represent? The symbol of the serpent, the nachash. So when you mix the two and you put them together, you will get um, a connection that is not of Yahweh. And that is found within the word satay. 
So I've got the word sate there, shintet. And shate means to turn aside and to turn from what is right. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Say again. So connecting Yahweh's anointing with the serpent, you create something that turns away from what is right. So what do we see in the body of Messiah today? We see a lot of people claiming the anointing of Yahweh, and then they do things in the name of the anointing of Yahweh that is related to things of the Nachash. And that's where things turn away from what is right. But things start to go astray. And that's even further confirmed by the grammatria of the letters Shintet, which is 309, which means rebel, increase, evil, deeds, that swerve, bad. Hadat Rimon. Now, Hadat Rimon is an interesting word. Rimon means pomegranate that links to the Torah. And Hadat is the name of an idol. So you connect an idol to Yahweh's Torah. Same concept of the anointing at the Nachash. The next is lump and plot that blocks blood flow. We're all familiar with what that causes as well. And to shut in, enclose, problem, wife, harem, field, which is about worldly things. And then we get the lion roaring, which is the symbol of the lion of Judah, the Messiah. And as a result of that and his work, uh, we get a witness. There's a fence that's been set up, which is Yahweh's commandments. And then you turn back and you turn away from what is wrong. And then you are delivered and you can enter into the land. So we can see all the meanings still support the same idea of a rebel that cause evil deeds, that swerve the truth and create something that is turning away from what is right. And that's basically the evil judges or the e evil officers and leaders that are currently working within different realms, within the realm, the social realm, the religious realm, and the political realm. We see those leaders playing out on every single level, and they are basically pulling people to follow them into their ways, which is away from Yahweh's way. Um, and we should not be entrapped by um, doing that. We should not be sheeple and not think. We should test everything against Yahweh's word and seek Yahweh's judges, seek Yahweh's leaders and Yahweh's officers and follow them in truth together um, as a body of Mashiach. Now, the two letters that's left is the pay and the resh, which make the word par. Um, that's the blue and the black there. Um, par means bullock, ox, and strength. And that's another term for the letter Aleph, which is another term for Yahweh. So now we see the strength that is even within this whole concept of good leaders and evil leaders and the mixing of anointing with the Nachash. Yahweh is still in the midst and he still provides the strength to get these people out of that entrapment. Now, the Gematria of 280 reveals a, a deeper level on what we already highlighted are the two camps or two leaders and the two uh, sets of people following the different leaders. Um, on the negative side, we see the tactics of the false leaders and they are salesmen. Salesmen is normally to do with what you can get. If you follow me, you'll get a mansion, a red Ferrari, a lot of money, a lot of stuff. You know, they all sales, and that's a prosperity teaching. Um, what that results is, is bondage. We get the, the term wild ass. Now, the wild ass is another term for ass. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've got a New Zealand accent. I think that's how. Anyway. Oh, goodness. Wild ass. No, wild ass is another term for Ishma. Now we're going to find Ishma a bit later on. Um, then, of course, a rough place 
something that is foreign or alien, we get snares, plots, and to bind, and that result in bitterness, anguish, quiver, trembling, and fear, which is a technique used mm. by the enemy to deprive you and to cut you off from Yahweh's things. Mm -hmm. So what we see in here is what the enemy is doing to take away the strength from within us. And that enemy uses fear. Now in scripture, we see the two opposing things, faith versus fear. And faith is all about standing on Yahweh's word, believing in the truth, no matter what. Even though you see with the eye, you don't repeat with the mouth what you see. You say it is written and you speak Yahweh's word into that situation. That's what the righteous judge will do or the righteous people of Yahweh. What the enemy wants us to do, whatever they show us, whether it's false news or whatever, they want us to repeat what they say. And you now become a vehicle for repeating the lie and spreading seeds of fear in the hearts of men. And you, you are now indirectly doing the work of the Nahash within the midst of Yahweh's congregation, social scene, political scene, whatever scene. But also, if you keep on focusing on that, I mean, it's in the midst of your mind, it's coming out of your mouth, that's exactly what you're going to attract. It's reaffirming that. It's reaffirming that. So yeah. we have to be careful what we ponder upon because that will come out of our mouths and that will become a reality. Um, because yeah. what, you, what you say is what you... What you you're great, you're you great. And what, whatever's in the heart will come, will come out, out of the mouth. through the mouth. So if you're... And, and Think about it. It will go into your heart and that is what you will speak in the end. That becomes your reality. Your heart's your emotional center. And if you fear, if you take in information through the eye, it goes into the heart, it's instilling fear, then you will speak words that will reinforce the fear coming from your own mouth. What Yeshua did in the wilderness, we're in the wilderness as well, what did he do? He said, it is written. And he spoke the truth against the situation or against yeah. the attack. And that is what I want to reinforce here because we're practically in a situation where we are daily repeating the words of the things that we see that's reinforcing the message of fear and we sowing the seeds of the nachash wherever we go. It's like having, you know, clothes and all the seeds with a little, what do you call it, hooks and things. They stick on your clothes and wherever you walk, you just spread the seeds. We should get rid of the seed of the nachash and not carry that with us, but rather be positive and speak our truth. And say, even though I recognize this problem, I see the snake, I see the nachash, I see its tactics and all that, but it is written. And then you annul. Yahweh is in the midst. This is, he's, he's the strength. He's he the is strength. the ox in the midst yeah. of the leaders, in the midst of the congregation, mm -hmm. with the anointing and ability to pull us back out of that pit and that hole, the entrapment and the plots and the snares mm -hmm. and the fear that the enemy is currently using against us. Now, the positive words associated with that with 280, which associate with strength is watchful, watcher, chief, which is another word for um, leader, overseer, which is also a, a term for, for leader, um, ox, that's the strength, um, to record memorandum. Memorandum is something written down. And that refers to Yahweh's word. Then we get shepherd, pasture, friendly, and excitement. Who of you are excited? Who, who of you were excited last week? Are you excited every day of the week about something? About what Yahweh is doing? About what Yahweh is going to do? When I see these things, I get excited. Because we're living a sci-fi movie. <laughs> And Yahweh is going to turn up big time and we're going to see spectacular things. Mm. And he will be exalted and they will see who Yahweh, my Elohim is. Remember, he's no longer the Elohim or the God out there. He's now your personal God. He wants to have a personal connection with you in the midst of these things happening. And what we saw in the previous Torah portion was uh, 401. The 401 men that came to Jacob, which was Esau, was the Aleph Tav in disguise. 
-hmm. In the midst of the dark cloud and the turmoil, the Aleph Taf is there and he, he is closer than you think. Mm -hmm. That's the time when he will be the closest. And we saw that with um, the name of the next Torah portion, Kitize. The Aleph Taf has got the sword ready in this time frame of war, and he is your commander. Are you with him or are you? In, in amongst the people at the back, mingling with the nation, spreading fear and seeds of um, doubt? Or are you closest to the Messiah with the sword, fighting in the front ranks, speaking his word? Mm -hmm. So that's a, just a, a change of mindset, a change that we need to make in our minds in order not to fear, because the fear is your greatest enemy in this day. I think we need to remind ourselves that the scripture actually says that Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. Yeah, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is. But every ass will yeah. <laughs> ask. <laughs> will confess that he is Lord. Thank you, Philip. Sorry. <laughs> every well donkey. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, battle between good leaders, evil leaders, and then you get the flock. Which leader are you choosing? I think the Revelation 21 talks about um, there's a time there will be a separation between the sheep and the goats. Now, this time already started. There's a separation, mm. and there's a social separation, there's a religious separation, there's a political separation that's taking place. And you can't sit on the fence anymore. They will force you to pick a side. So who do you choose? And that is the question. And only you can answer it because you have a personal relationship with Yahweh, your Elohim, or are you going to follow your political party or your club or your whatever you follow? It's no longer about hiding in the masses. It's now about you and Yahweh. What are you choosing? Um, personally, very important. All right, next one. Just changing gears, topic of um, the story portion is the judges. Just to highlight the concept of the judges, we already saw in Deuteronomy the people wanted to king like the nations, and it actually played out in the book of Judges. And there were a total of 12 judges during six cycles, which I call the cycles of sin. Now, the cycle of sin is basically, they follow Yahweh, everything is good, and they mix with the nations, they bring a curse upon themselves. The curse is normally in the form of a pagan nation, oppressing them, then they get oppressed, then they cry out to Yahweh, and they repent, and Yahweh will send a good judge to lead them out of the bondage, and they'll be okay again. Until then, they will move on and they'll mix again with pagan nations. They put upon themselves the traditions of their worship or whatever they do. And they will bring a curse upon themselves. And that, that cycle repeated six times during the book of Judges. Now, where do you think we are at currently in this point in time? I think we're at the point of crying out and starting to repent. A lot of people are crying out and realizing um, the only one who can help us is Yahweh. We need to start crying out. We need to rid ourselves from paganism, from all these things that we are clinging to, all these false religions and things that we do in our culture, and start to turn back to the Torah, the third time, turn back to Yahweh's things. And that is the place or the time frame where Yahweh will bring in his righteous judges to lead his people out of this bondage. Now, this bondage that's going to come upon us is going to become the great tribulation. And I think we're going to phase into this. It won't be, oh, today is today. Yes, there will be a sign to see when it will start. But there's a birth pain period, which you can't really put your finger on how far we are, how close we are to the Jordan or not. All I can say is it's getting very intense. And we need to um, start looking for these righteous judges around us and start sitting around the, the, the word of Yahweh and preparing ourselves for his coming as a bride, but also as his army, because he is our righteous commander. Now, if you are with him, 
you are not going to fight yourself. Just like Jericho, he overcame the enemy on the behalf of his people. He will do the same here. We just need to follow his righteous judges and they will lead us in faith and truth. And we will cheer on the victories of our God as he overcome the enemy on our behalf. So that is the tactic. So don't, please don't go and write and do this and that, take things in your own hand. It's not our battle. It's the battle of our commander. We can look in detail on that uh, in a few slides to come, where you will see how the spiritual gear work and mechanics work within the state of war. Um, and we're going to uh, get a bit more insights and what our part is to play with in that situation. All right. So after the time period of the judges, they wanted a king. So Yahweh gave him a king, King Saul. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. No, Shaul is also um, the meaning uh, of uh, desire. It means desire because they desired the king. Interestingly enough, his name <laughs> means the same. But if you change the vowel points, it becomes Sheol. That means grave, underworld, hell, realm of the dead. And that's basically one of the things that Shaul did or Saul did. He consulted the dead through a medium and then eventually ended up in that same realm. So he could talk to the dead all day long. So that was the tactics of a false king, of a false leader. And Shaul is the picture of the unrighteous king in the context of our righteous king that is coming, Saul or King Saul represent the anti-Messiah king. That king will come first. That's where the great deception and the great falling away will come because the Messiah has got the ability to do works of uh, miracles and do a lot of you know, spectacular uh, signs and wonders. And the anti-Messiah is going to have an anointing, but he's going to go against the things of the Torah, and he will still do all those miraculous, miraculous work, works. And those who are trained up, running after prophets, this prophet's in town, that one's in town, oh, there's the Messiah, and they will run after this Messiah or that Messiah, whatever. We read about that in the New Testament as well. So if you're not sensitive of testing the prophets, testing the leaders through whatever comes out of their mouths, that's how you find a false prophet. Are they speaking from the platform of the Torah? If not, switch them off. Don't go. Don't listen to them. Because they have power. They have truth. But it's intermingled with the tet, the venom of the nahash, which make it very dangerous. And that might only be 10% which is a lie, but it will suck you in, waste your time, and you will eventually sit on the wrong side of the fence when the penny drops, when that time comes. So don't take this lightly. It's very serious in order to differentiate between the right leaders and the wrong ones. Now, Saul comes from the word Sha'al, and Sha'al means to beg, to consult, and to seek. Well, that's also what he did. He consulted the dead. But it's also begging. Begging is the concept we found in the Torah portion, the Yetchanan, that means I pleaded. And what we discovered there was the leaders pleading with Yahweh in the context of Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Lord, Lord, we've done this, that, and the other. He said, go away from me. I don't know you, you lawless ones. Now, what's interesting is that King Saul was a, from the tribe of Benjamin, and later on, the Benjamites were called the sons of Belial, or the lawless ones. And they nearly died out as a tribe because of the sin they committed. So that is the risk of following the false king. You might be completely annihilated um, during the time of Yahweh's judgment coming upon the unrighteous. Now, after Saul, the righteous king came, which is King David, or the beloved king, which is a picture of our real king, Messiah, who is uh, Yeshua. And he is the one that will lead us. Now, when you look at the time frame, King Saul will pitch around the start of the Great Tribulation, and he will rule up to the point where he will be bound, and then there will be a thousand years. He will be released, 
and then the real king will rule during the eighth millennium. So there's a time frame of the rule of the anti-Messiah or King Saul, which is three and a half years. And then there's a second wilderness experience where the people will be refined. We can look at that a bit later on. And then the eighth millennium, King Messiah, the real Messiah will come um, and he will rule over his kingdom. All right, any comments? In the, on the topic of the prophets, a prophet like Moses, that's a verse that is quoted in Acts 3 verse 17 from this Torah portion, which is Deuteronomy 8, 15, 18 and 19, that says, Yahweh your Elohim will send you a prophet, an Israelite like me, you must listen to him. This is what you ask Yahweh your Elohim uh, to give you on the day of the assembly at Mount Herod, or Mount okay. Herod, which is Mount Sword. You said, we never want to hear the voice of Yahweh our Elohim or see his raging fire again. If you do, we'll die. Mm -hmm. if, if we do, we'll die. Yahweh told me, what they said is good. So I will send them a prophet, an Israelite like you. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I commanded him. Whoever refuses to listen to the words that prophets speak in my name will answer to me. But any prophet who dares to say something in my name that I didn't command him to say, or who speaks in the name of, another, of, of other gods must die. So this is a very serious warning against prophets speaking in Yahweh's name. And if it's not something that Yahweh told them to say, they will die. That's as plain as simple as it is. Now, the preceding verse reveals the prophet to us in the book of Acts, where it actually revealed the prophet like Moses. He is Yeshua, the Messiah. He is the prophet, and we should listen to everything he commands us. If we don't listen to him, we will answer to the Father, answer to Yahweh. So that's also a serious warning. So what did Yeshua say? I did not come to abolish the Torah. So what do we do? We don't listen to him. We abolish the Torah. That's a serious breach of the prophet like Moses and what he said. And then on top of that, we have people running around as prophets Opening up schools of prophets, I just put two there. I don't want to discredit anyone, but there's two examples I found. There are many, many courses. You can buy them online, all that, to teach you to become a prophet. But that is very dangerous because if Yahweh hasn't called you to be a prophet and you're playing or imitating a prophet and say things and Yahweh hasn't said anything, you will die. That's the warning. Don't do it. So this is a warning to all those so-called prophets out there. Repent and don't be a prophet unless you're 100% sure that Yahweh called you. The test is in the proof of what you say. If there's anything you prophesy that hasn't come to pass, you are a false prophet. But also, it's Stop not based on Torah. It's not based on Torah. Yeah, that's the other thing. On what foundation are you standing claiming to be a prophet? If you're not standing on Torah, please step down and don't be a prophet because it's very dangerous. It's life-threatening. There's a big warning. And because people don't read Deuteronomy 18, they think it's a game. They think it's beautiful. I attended the church. I'm not going to mention where. The majority of the people in that church are prophets. And they stand all day long speaking things around uh, over each other. Oh, God told me this. God told me that. Blah, 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 blah. It's all about you will meet this person. You'll have a new job and all that. It's Soothsaying, it's having a crystal ball trying to predict the future. The purpose of a prophet is to repeat the word of Yahweh. It is written. And if you don't listen to those words, then he will prophesy what will happen to you. And that's normally not good. So prophets are normally hated by the people. When you look in history, they normally killed the real prophets. Now we gather around the prophets and we claim them to be real. They are false because they don't teach repentance. They don't preach repentance. And that's the proof whether you're a false or a true prophet. During the month of uh, um, Elul, 
during the time prophetically where we're in, the prophets need to preach repentance, turn back to the Torah, turn back to the Moedim, turn back to the old way. Those will be the true prophets, not the ones to tell you, you can have a new job, you can have money, you're going to meet someone. You can read your horoscopes. That's better. At least you know where it's coming from. This one is a lie. So just a stern warning there for anyone who's entangled with that or anyone who subscribed to those people. Please you don't do it. strong about that? I do. <laughs> because it's a warning. They will die. Like. It's serious. Yeah. Anyway. Stepping into the new Torah portion. The second one. Kitizai. That means when you go to war. When you go out. Kitizai. When you go out where? Go out to war. This is the context of the situation that we are currently in prophetically. The birth pains is a time where the tension is growing. And when the tension comes to fulfillment during the time of the birth, that's also the starting of the war. And that war will end up in a war called Armageddon, which is one of the first of the two wars. Why two wars? If you read the Torah portion, it starts off in Deuteronomy 21 about the theme of a war. And in chapter 25, it ends with a theme of a war. So this Torah portion is sandwiched in between two wars. When you overlay a prophetic framework over it, it's the war of Armageddon and the war of Gog and Magog with the seventh millennium right in the middle. And in the middle of this parasha, there are 72 commandments for the people who will go through the seventh millennium of what they need to do to be refined. Now I've got the gematria of 72 at the bottom here that says these are the meanings, darkness, cloud, weeping, to restrain, to mull, which means to grind, to refine. That's the purpose of the white press. It's to refine. And it's a dark time. There's a lot of weeping and restraining people from not doing what they want anymore because there's nothing to do it with. Everything is destroyed by the first war. And they will come out of that in, and walk into this desert, the second wilderness experience. And as an end result of that, you'll see the positives coming out, whom Elohim observes. He will watch. He will um, oversee the whole process of being refined. And out of that refinement will come goodness, kindness, sons of faithfulness, springs of living water, which is a symbol of his spirit. My God is Elohim. That's a personal relationship. Yahweh, my Elohim. They realize that. And Yahweh is willing. And Yahweh is willing to go through that process of refinement with the people who's coming out of that first war, coming out of the great tribulation. Those who are now into the seventh millennium and circling around Mount Gilead. I'm just going to put that one in there which is a mixed multitude, and they will go through a similar process as the first wilderness experience in order to be refined because they haven't listened the first time. So through Yahweh's grace, he's extending his hand yet again in order to refine and trying to save every person because Yahweh, his motive is love. His motive is not um, revenge or he's not angry. He's a loving God. He's angry against the system and he wanted to destroy the system that's um, placing his people in bondage. All right. So when you go out, we're going to look at the word go out, and then you shall not forget. So if we connect those two things together, you get a phrase. Kitize, lo shalach. And that means when you go out to war, you shall not forget. What you shall not forget? You shall not forget to forget Amalek. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? What is Amalek? Amalek is the flesh. You need to forget the enemy and not mention their names. You need to forget who you are and your fleshiness. You need to leave your ego behind, who you are. Paul calls it, I need to die to myself. That's what it means to forget Amalek. And you need to forget as part of this process, the refinement will grind away the ego, will grind away the self, and then you will become pure and refined and be an empty vessel to be filled with Yahweh's light as he then use you. So go out is the word kitize. Wait, wait, wait. 
So why is the phrase you shall not forget there then? Oh, it's just the last yeah. word in the Torah portion. Oh, you shall not forget, forget to blot out the remembrance of Amalek. Oh, okay. So don't forget to forget Amalek. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't forget to forget the okay. flesh. Okay. Don't forget to forget the beast system. That in fact, mm -hmm. it's that whole thing we looked at last week. All right, so Kitize comes from the root word Yatsa, um, which is, sorry, Taza. No, it's Yatsa. It needs a Yote, sorry, misspelled. That means out, forth, go out, go forward, to come out of. Where have you heard that before? It sounds familiar. Come out of her, my people. Revelation 18.4. Yahweh instructs us to come out of her, my people. The female is always a religious system. The system is entangled with a cancer called Babylon. And his people are entrapped in that system. So the body of Messiah has got cancer. We need to come out of it. We need to follow the leaders. We need to follow the, the righteous judges. Listen to them and come out of this religious system. If you're still entrapped in the religious system, you're basically going to dance around Mount Gilead during the seventh millennium. And that's your, your grace that Yahweh will extend to you if you don't listen. Or you will die during the war, which is the Great Tribulation. The choice is yours. Very serious consequences. I don't want either of them. Okay, Yatsan uh, is first used in Scripture in Genesis 1 verse 12 that basically referred to um, that the earth brought forth, or yatsa, grass and herbs, yielding seed after its own kind. So this refining process is also a multiplication process. As people are refined, they need to bring forth fruit after their own kind. And the fruit, of course, is your offspring, or the people you engage with that now come to faith. That is your offspring. And you need to be after your own kind, and you need to be after Yahweh's kind. So that process is a continual thing, uh, process, just like we have now. We need to multiply um, people within the kingdom. That multiplication will happen during the seventh millennium as well. Now, this desert experience um, has a last war, which is referred to this second war of um, Amalek. And that is basically the preparation that need to take place during the seventh millennium is to have the troops ready to battle against the enemy at the end of the seventh millennium. We've got the same challenge now. They will have the same challenge then. The mantra of Kitize is 438. That means Elohim destroys. What will he destroy? He will first destroy Babylon, and secondly, he will destroy your flesh or your fleshiness. Which is include people get Amalek. He will destroy Amalek. Then man of Elohim will stand up, dwell in Elohim, she will walk in Elohim, you'll have vigor, um, you will be bought and become and prominent and be one of the sprinkled ones and be entwined. Entwined is another way to become a chat or become one within the household of Elohim. So that's the outcome of the preparation and refinement that Yahweh is extending yet again during the time of the thousand years that is coming between the two wars. Right, forget is, a, is the other word that I want to look at. Forget is the word shakah, shakah, um, that comes from the primitive root that means to forget, be forgotten, and cause to forget. It's first found in Genesis 27:45 where Sarah advised Jacob to flee from his brother Esau and from his anger until he forgets what Jacob did to him. So the topic in this context is the birthright. Now the birthright, as we discussed previously, always link back to the covenant. The covenant has got promises, that's the physical blessings, but it's also got the priestly task of looking after the family and carrying the culture, the Hebrew culture, from one generation to another after your own kind. And that's a, the, the, the full package of what the birthright is. But Esau only wanted 
the last one, the one that's to do with the flesh, not the one that has to do with the spirit. So he lost it to Esau, uh, to, to Jacob. So what is fueling the battle currently during the two wars? It's the spirit that was behind Esau that is the same spirit that's behind these two wars that is about to happen. Now, when we read about this, the concept of the powers, principalities that we fight against that Paul talked about in, in Ephesians 6 verse 12, is there is a spiritual realm with a spiritual reality with spiritual entities and powers um, that need to be overcome first before it will realize and come to pass in the physical. Now we get the scene in Daniel 10 that explains this beautifully. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, 14, and 18, where he says, And he told me, Do not be afraid, Daniel. Elimhim has heard everything that you said ever since the first day that you uh, decided to humble yourself in front of your Elohim so that you could learn to understand things. I've come uh, in response to your prayer. The commander of the Persian kingdom opposed me for 21 days. Now, this is an interesting phrase because it's a messenger that's coming to Daniel and said, I've heard you from day one. It's now day 21. I've been opposed by the commander or the prince of Persia. Now, that commander is the principality of power in the spiritual where there was a battle raging between the messenger and this command of Persia. Now we're going to look at where the messenger is in, in the next slide, but the idea I want to highlight here is that the battle that raged was first in the spiritual and then it was overcome in the physical. Because when you look at the statue on the right, you get the Babylonian kingdom, then you get the Medo-Persia. Now this is the context of Daniel 10. It's that power that needed to overcome in the spiritual and then it was destroyed in the physical. After that, the Greek kingdom was destroyed in the spiritual and then the physical, and then the Roman kingdom in the spiritual and then in the physical, and that was during Yeshua's time, round about there. Now, the one that's still left is the one with the mixed clay and the feet. That's the last kingdom mm -hmm. that need to be destroyed in the spiritual first and then in the physical. So the spirit behind Esau is the same spirit, which is the Nachash, who's manifesting in the spiritual realm through powers and principalities, and is also behind all the physical leaders with amongst those powers and kingdoms that are opposing Yahweh's people. So the spirit that's behind the, the, uh, the powers that oppose us now is a spiritual entity that is not defined by a kingdom like Persian, Greek, or Roman. So we're going to see who that is in a moment. Um, so that's the main thing I want to highlight. So we're going to look now at the, what am I looking at? Oh, the concept of um, 21 days that he prayed or prepared himself. Now the number 21 in the Gematra of 21 is to be good, to do good, to be pleasing, servant of Yahweh, hiding place, whisper, murmuring, vision, appearance. So from that, you'll see that all fits in with prostrating yourself before Yahweh, whispering or praying softly, murmuring or bringing your petition, um, finding Yahweh your hiding place, you're a servant of him, you're pleasing unto him, and you're making petitions on behalf of the people. As a result of that, you'll see the battle raging in the, in the spiritual, which is surely to break forth, to burst forth, and woe, which is a term for judgment. And as a result of that spiritual battle, you'll get possession, festive, and to be glad. So you see the, 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 the result of this conflict. You take back possession of either those who are captive, or you take possession of the land, or you take possession of the the power of the kingdom that you are facing. And as a result of that, there's victory, there's festivity, and people are glad. So what is Daniel's job in this context? Did he put on armor and 
got a riot together and a lot of um, a mob of people with shovels and forks and all sorts of things and guns. No, he was on his face praying and asking Yahweh to show him what is to come and to speak to him so he can repeat the words that Yahweh is telling him. And that's a sign of a true prophet. True prophets today will lie on their faces asking Yahweh words that they need to speak into this situation so that the spiritual power behind the chaos that we're currently in will be destroyed in the spiritual. What are the prophets doing today? They've got television shows driving around, having meetings, taking people's money and telling them what they want to hear. It's false prophets. True prophets will hear the voice of Yahweh and then say, it is written, and then speak the truth of Yahweh's word within the spiritual so that those battles can be won in the spiritual realm. Can you go back to the verse? Because I don't, you didn't read the whole verse. I didn't want to. You didn't want to. Yeah, because I'm going to get to that in okay. a moment. I can probably read some of that. Um, he said, the commander of the Persian kingdom opposed me for 21 days, but then Michael, one of the chief commanders, came to help me because I was left alone with the kings of Persia. I've come to explain uh, to you what will happen to your people in the last days because the vision is about times still to come. So what Daniel received here is what we read in the book of Daniel about the times that we are about to face. So he was on his face seeking Yahweh to find the wisdom of the last kingdom, the feet, and what is to come for the last generation. And then he said, do not be afraid. No, again, oh, sorry. the person. Again, the person who looked like a human touched me and I become stronger. He said, do not be afraid. You are highly respected. Everything is all right. Be strong, be strong. So what do we do? Be afraid, be afraid. <laughs> be weak, be weak. <laughs> what do we do? We should listen. Yes. Do not be afraid. Don't fear. Be strong, be strong. We've got the ox yes. in the mix within amongst this chaos that we're in. The Aleph Tav is with us. Our king commander is fighting yes. currently with Michael in the heavenlies mm -hmm. against the enemy of the bottom feet kingdom, the kingdom yes. that will be defeated. Feet will be cut. I love this verse. Yeah. Very powerful verse. Mm -hmm. And that is our job. If we want to work with Yahweh alongside him, we should ask him what words we need to speak mm. so that this kingdom can be destroyed. But also just to know that the, the battle is being fought for us and yeah. spiritually so that we can be strong. Yeah. Because we will overcome. Yes. Yeah. All right. So what is this new kingdom? What is the last kingdom? This last kingdom is interestingly a mixture of clay and iron. iron. Now Babylon, that is the head of gold, means mixing and confusion. So what's basically happening is that the kingdom of Babylon is also manifesting in the bottom layer, which is the spiritual Babylon infesting the kingdoms of this world, recreating the kingdom of Babylon, the head of the statue in our midst today. Mm -hmm. And what do we do? We are confused and we mix everything. We mix gender, we mix lies with truth. Um, we mix scripture with man-made traditions. We're all about mixing nowadays. Mm -hmm. We mix food kosher and unclean, mix that together, that's fine. We just go crazy with mixing because the kingdom of Babylon is alive and well today. And he came down and he's hiding in plain sight. The real enemy. And that's revealed in Revelation as well. And Babylon will be finally destroyed where the head will be crushed once and for all. Who's behind the head of Babylon? The Nachash. His head 
will be crushed once and for all, and the Mashiach will step on his head. All right, so our prayers are important. Not to fear is your job, and we need to intercede for Yahweh's people and for what's happening around us and ask Yahweh to reveal to us what we must speak mm -hmm. into our situation today so that we can say it is written and then speak light and speak life. Not be fearful, not repeat in fear, not repeat what we see on TV, but repeat what you fear, but speak what Yahweh tells you to say. Even if it's a passage you remind you to speak, just say it out loud, speak it into a situation every day so we can have the victory because he's fighting on our behalf. Any comments or questions at this stage? Alrighty. Okay. I'm going to jump back into this slide quickly because we are going to get confirmation of this crazy visual that connects us to a carbon body which links to three sixes. Then we'll go through the processes of number four, which are three doorways, in order to become three Alephs or reunited with Yahweh in a real way. So that whole process is linked to a body, a spiritual, a spiritual body of light or light being um, that is connected to the um, this very scarce material called beryllium. And that's got the ability to um, transfer light through it. So a light body can transfer light and we will be light beings and light is associated with truth and fire and holiness. So that's the context of the renewed body. So what I want to highlight here is also found in Daniel 10. This time, verse 4 to 6 and, to, and verse 8. And it says, on the 24th day of the first month, I was by the great Tigris River. When I looked up, I saw the man dressed in linen, and he had the belt made of gold from Uphaz, Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl. That's the crystal beryllium. His face looked like lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and legs looked like polished bronze. When he spoke, his voice sounded like the roar of a crowd. So I was left alone to see this grand vision I had no strength left in me. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. I heard the man speak and I listened to his words. I fainted face down on the ground. And that's when the man that looked like a human touched him and he regained his strength. And he told him, don't fear, be strong, be strong. Mm -hmm. So this is the messenger revealed. And it's none other than Yeshua, the Messiah who appeared in his real body that will look like our renewed bodies. And this body is in the spiritual realm where Yahweh exists in the realm of light, fire, truth, and holiness. We've, we found in the previous study when we looked at the tabernacle that fire is a foundational concept within the character of Yahweh. He is a consuming fire. Fire produces light. And light is translated through this light body that gives you the appearance of a being, which I call um, the, the, the light body that relates to the crystal beryllium. So that's just another confirmation of um, that previous concept that's confirmed. I never saw day. this before, the body yeah. that was like beryl. Yeah. That's interesting. And the wheel within the wheel, those wheels are also of peril, the same, with the eyes upon them. Everything is, is related to that. And the, the city of, of New Jerusalem is a crystal city. It's all about trans, um, trans, translating and transferring light in every direction and right through it. Everything is see through and light can just shine right through everything all the time. But what I want to underline here, I heard the man speak, and as I listened to his words, I fainted. So 
Daniel listened to the words that were spoken. And then Daniel took those words and then he repeated them. And we now have the privilege of having them written down. Mm. All right, we're stepping on to the last topic which is in Deuteronomy 21, which is the first verse of this Torah portion anyway, which is uh, uh, the concept of the first topic of war. Verse 11 says, if you see a beautiful woman among the camp captives and have your heart set on her, you may marry her. She must shave her head, cut her nails, and no longer wear the clothes that she was wearing when you captured her. So this sounds very controversial because you're not supposed to marry people from the other nations now when you saw a beautiful one you can take her we saw that in the, in the context of Balaam and Balak they took the beautiful woman from the Moabites I think and that caused them to bring a curse upon themselves but now in the time of war you're allowed to take the beautiful woman but you need to sort of convert us you need to bring her down to a very unattractive state and if you still feel attracted to her, you can keep her. If not, you need to set her free. You're not allowed to sell her. So this is um, an interesting concept that drew my attention because there must be something behind this to reveal truth about the prophetic um, that's applicable to us living in this day. So this concept is first and foremost in, in relation to a marriage, which is a covenant relationship. So now we see a beautiful woman in relation to a covenant relationship. We see a woman that has the opportunity to come into a covenant relationship. And if we replace the person with Messiah, Messiah want to bring people into a covenant relationship during the time of war. So that's people coming to faith. They can come into a covenant relationship and become part of his bride during the first war. So there's a lot of opportunity for part of the bride to still come to faith and still have the realization and still be part of that initial group that will be translated um, at the end of the Great Tribulation. So, so, so that's uh, the prophetic meaning of, of that. Now, I decided to look at the three things that need to happen to us. You need to shave her head, cut her nails, and change her clothing. So the first one is shaving the hair. Uh, hair. What is that all about? The shave is the word kalach. That means bald. Bald is linked to korach. That means rebellion. So she need to rebel against authority because your head covering for a woman is her authority. It's a sign that she submit under her husband or submit under authority. So shaving the hair means that she no longer submit under the previous authority of her previous culture and she is now submitting under the new culture indirectly rebelling against her old culture so when you come to faith you rebel against sin you rebel against all things that's wrong that's no line with Yahweh and now you become part of that new culture which is called the Hebrew culture and that's the first step this lady need to do so what you note there is the three letters Gimel, Lamet, Chet and within those letters there's a few hints because Gimel means um, camel that relates to the wilderness. So she will go through a wilderness experience. And that is, in this case, the Great Tribulation. It could also mean um, the wine press. Then we have the Lamet. Lamet has to do with learning. So she's rebelling against her old. Now need to take on a new culture. New culture all about learning Yahweh's work. The Torah contains the culture. She need to learn that. That's the Lamet. And then the Chet is the gate of life that she can walk through. That's the covenant relationship entry gate, um, which is one of the dalits that lead into from those va 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 to the um, aleph, aleph, aleph. All right, so the, the, the word chalach is found in Genesis 41, 14, when Joseph was brought from prison, from his prison cell, where he was shaved and brought before the king, King Pharaoh, and he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. In context of the big picture, Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue. Joseph is interpreting Pharaoh's dream, which is all about the Great Tribulation. Can you see the connection, the same pattern overlaying through the same concept? So the prophecy of the Great Tribulation 
is found within the book of Daniel, but it's also found within the pattern of the seven skinny cows and the seven fat cows and the symbolism within. Galah has the gematria of 41. That means burning coal, coals of fire, branding scar, burn, to throw down, to thrust down, to cast away. So that cleansing process that has to do with fire, that's the purification of holiness process. Again? The same. Okay. Uh, I just said, I just noticed um, the last first use in Genesis 41 14. It's 4114, and it has the Gematria 41. Yeah. yeah. Just interesting. Yeah. And Aleph Taf is 401, yeah. which is and then we have the meanings to shave off, bald, become fools, and to cease. So that's to stop your old way. And then we get to the um, border, which is out there. Out there is another term for regions beyond, which is another word, Ivri, which can be translated as Hebrew. And you have to cross the border or cross over the border, which is the Jordan. And that's part of the becoming a new culture. And then show willingness, strength, a new beginning, mother, fertile place, her own tent, territory, be pleased, be joined to the majesty of Elohim. So all of these beautiful meanings are associated with her rebelling against the old culture, learning the new culture, joined to the majesty of Elohim, having her own tent and becoming fertile and being my new uh, also retaining strength and inheriting the land or the territory that Yahweh has given her. Beautiful picture of um, process. The say again? Battery is running low. We're just fixing it up. Oh. All right, the next one is cutting the nails. Nails is the word tipuren. That means nail and diamond tip. It comes from the root word safar. That means depart early. This word depart early is first found in scripture in Judges. There's three interesting from the book of Judges, though. In the context of a righteous judge, Gideon, who had to choose uh, 300 men from 32,000. Um, and the first test was those who fear, those who are afraid, need to depart early and remove themselves. 10,000 was left. So another hint why we should not be afraid, because Yahweh will remove you from his army. If you fear, you cannot serve in under the commander Yeshua during his time coming. And if you're not with the commander, it's like not being part of the uh, people walking behind the Ark of the Covenant where the Levites are. The further you are away from the Levites, the more waters of the Jordan will get to your feet, to your knees, and even your body. And you'll feel the full uh, wrath of the great tribulation. But if you're close to the commander, close to the covenant, you will walk through it to dry ground. Mm. So this is a bit of a warning. If you're afraid, you'll be at the back. When you're strong, you'll walk behind the commander, walk behind the covenant and walk through the great tribulation to dry ground. So fear is your enemy. And where do they need to depart? From Mount Gilead. It's the mountain which is associated with the wine press where our Christian brothers will assemble those who say the Torah has done away with legalism, blah, 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 all those things. They will be at the back of the queue because they are afraid or they're not um, brave enough to embrace the fullness of the Torah and they will end up in the wine press, which is the tail end of walking behind the, the Levites. Okay, 
All of this is in context of the time frame of the sixth millennium, second millennium, seventh and eighth. We're currently at the sixth. Moving from the sixth to the seventh is the River Jordan. That's the war, the great war that ends the first wilderness experience. That starts the second wilderness experience. And at the end of the second um, wilderness experience, there's another war, which is Gog and Magog, that will enter into the eighth millennium where the kingdom will come down where Yeshua will reveal himself as he is. The crystal city um, of the new Jerusalem will come down and the kingdom will be established and the King Mashiach will reign. So we need to be very close to the commander because the commander will uh, lead his army, but he will also judge. And after that, during the eighth millennium, he will change his role from judge to king. So we want to be with the king and we want to be with our commander. So don't fall behind. <clears throat> don't be afraid. Be strong, be strong. Mm -hmm. All right. So interesting that this woman had a month of humiliation, of cutting nails, cutting hair and changing clothing. The word month is um, the word yarech that has to do with um, a cycle, um, the lunar cycle specifically, which is a one month cycle. Now Yarech has the gematria of 218. That means heat, anger, burning, thing that is crushed, trembling and panic. That sounds like a war. That's the cycle um, ending, the six millennium, millennium ending through that. And then we have uh, the lunar cycle, delay, tarry, that's the Messiah uh, tearing to come. And at the end of the tribulation, he will come down. But until then, there will be pain, hardship, sorrow, toil, um, cave dwellers, colored, which are different native nations. And then quite interesting, the word Hagarites. Hagarites is the word Agari, which is Hagar with a yod that you can translate as my Hagar. So it's as if Yahweh look at this woman who was once a covenant woman. She was married to Abraham and she was separated from Abraham because she was um, not his beloved. And because of that, she was removed and entered into the wilderness. But Yahweh still call her my Hagar. He still want to bring her back into covenant. And these are the people who were once in covenant the people who's at Mount Gilead, our Christian brothers who rejected Torah, they are now in the second wilderness experience, just like Hagar, but Yahweh still loves her. Call her my Hagar. He still extended grace to her, showed her and opened up a fountain so she can live, mm -hmm. and then call her back into the household after that refinement period of the wine press. What we see as a result of that is white bread, a creation, a new thing, created thing, large veil, which relates to the previous tent, and Yahweh has created. So it's all about completing and fulfilling the creation process of humanity, specifically these covenant people who went astray. They've got another opportunity. But with them are the colored people, the cave dwellers, the people of many colors, or many nations, they will be with her. And they will also have an opportunity to become part of his covenant and to be made complete. Beautiful picture there to just show you always grace. The last one is to change your clothes. Now, clothes is the word simlach. That means wrapper, mantle, or covering like a garment, clothes, raiment, and a cloth comes from the root word shemel, that means image, statue, and idol. Isn't that interesting? That your garment represents your culture, and your culture has got idol worship embedded in it. Sometimes you are the idol that you worship, and you cover yourself with beautiful garments, hang yourself with beautiful jewelry, and paint your face with a beautiful woman in the time of war. Isn't that interesting? So we're not allowed to wear makeup. Well, you know, worship yourself. <laughs> okay. 
Otherwise, you worship Amalek. You need to forget to for don't forget to forget Amalek. Yes. <laughs> and wash your face. Get rid of that makeup. <laughs> anyway. All right. So Shemel is going to the march of 130. That's associated with the following words. Image, idol, clay, I. Is that maybe to do with I? Makeup? No. It's to do with religion. Uh -huh. Remember the two eyes that we looked at previously? Um, COVID. Isn't that interesting? COVID means hidden, covered. Now, in, I think it's in Revelation or Matthew. No, Matthew, it says wars and rumors of wars. Now, that word rumor can also be translated as COVID wars or hidden wars or wars that are not visible to the sheeple. Those who just follow the news and all this and that, they don't really study. They think everything is still okay. They go to and fro, they marry, they do this and make money. And before they know it, the pot is boiling and it's too hot. Now that is what this new war about that we currently, I think, entered. is a hidden war that is fought in the spiritual and we're starting to see physical manifestations because the two realms already overlapped and we see the opposition and the conflict the waves of the energy flowing to and fro and the conflict within social circles religious circles political circles is starting to to happen and that is a hidden war and i think third world war is a hidden one there will be a manifestation in the physical but it's happening in the spiritual first so you can imagine what is happening in the spiritual realm right now if we see the things we see today mm -hmm. in the physical? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the battle raging mm -hmm. with our commander, Yeshua, battling out and fighting? What are we doing now to support him? To be on our faces, interceding and speaking life, speaking his word. It is written, repeating the things and not fear and be strong mm -hmm. in order, like Moses asked was, lifted up and upheld so the battle can be won our hands need to be lifted up and we need to be strong speaking like good judges and good leaders light into the situation life into the situation in regard to establishing Yahweh's kingdom and destroying his enemies all righty where did i go now <laughs> that was just the hidden things okay then moving on we have um, poverty, misery, poor, wrecked, child, ruins. That's a result of this conflict. And then after the smoke clears or during this process, there will be deliverance. People will escape. They will be gathered. They will be presentable. They will prepare themselves. They will stand before Mount Sinai. They will hear the voice. They will have a ladder like a Jacob's ladder experience. They will come into the kingdom. They will benefit and be used for service in the army of Yahweh. And they will be interweaved and making a heart. They will experience and have access to the springs of living water of his anointing and will receive double for what they lost and get a double anointing and then engage into the riches, the treasures and the prosperity of Yahweh's kingdom and see him as, his, as their great king. So all of this is our reward if we stay strong during this time of conflict that is coming, that is associated with changing your culture, changing your clothes, removing idols from what you do. Um, don't bow down to idols. Don't bow down to things that's not from Yahweh. Stand on the truth and stand fast and he will overcome them. And we need to help him to win this battle. That's basically the same as being a bond servant or a bond woman. Yeah. Yeah. So this is basically breaking the idols. If you take it back to Sinai and build a golden calf, that's religion. Religion will be broken mm -hmm. because Yahweh will no longer confirm the lie. Mm -hmm. They will try and do miracles. It will not work anymore because his name is attached to it. He will not make it happen. The idols will fall over and break. They will be destroyed um, during this time coming. And they will see the greatness of Yahweh. 
So that is what I have for us today. I now open up for any questions or comments. No, no, it's still good. Um, Philip, you know, um, going back, I just noticed going back to um, the word uh, Shafat, Shafat. Shafat. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, um, where you said part of the gematria was um, the, the wild ass. Yes. Wild ass. Wild ass. Yeah. There you go. Shafat. Shafat. Wild ass. Uh, yeah. Um, isn't it? Um, is it Ishmael or Esau that is? Prophesied, it says he will be a wild ass of a man. Is that yeah. Ishmael? Ishmael. Um, Esau. Yeah, Ishmael. When Hagar is given that prophecy for her son. For her son, yeah. For his, it's Ishmael that is prophesied he's going to be a wild ass of a man. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, I just found that, that mm. connection interesting because you mentioned Hagar at the end. And also the like with that gematria, the negative is the wild aspect. In the positive, there's the ox, which is sort of like the the opposite. Um, because in this Torah portion, it also mentioned, or you didn't talk about it today, but it's the the law about not um, uh, muzzling a and not, not what do you call it? No, not tethering. No, not that one. Oh, not yoking. Yoking. Not yoking the ox with the, the donkey. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It. Like the shin and the the tet connection as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't put the two together. Ox, ox, ox and well, the mixing the mixing the two together. Yeah. 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 And we also have to remember that Ishmael was not. Ray, he actually became a prince. Yeah. Yeah. So the different thing. That's interesting. Anyone else? Um, the when you mentioned um no, what was it? Sapar. For um, depart early in that whole um, with the Gideon's army, yeah. it made me think of support Moses' wife, who also departed early. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Similar thing. To, you know, she didn't. That's right. Come, Philip. Come listen here. Sorry. Philip is out quickly. He'll be back in a second. This is interesting, Sarah. She also departed early. Oh, she departed early? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because she didn't go on with it. You know, there's an Ethiopian yeah, yeah. with another Ethiopian wife, didn't he? And mm -hmm. there's nothing much. There's said nothing else said of her. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, the connection I make with my Hagar and Wild Ass, as well as the people that will go through this wine press, I think there will be a lot of Ishmael there. Mm -hmm. um, good people who has been deceived by their religion. Mm -hmm. And if they survive the first war, they will have an opportunity to be a fight. If not, they will be part of the people who will go up against Jerusalem and then try to destroy it. So we don't know how it's going to play out. It's a Yahweh, my Elohim situation. Now it's a personal thing. You can no longer hide behind the culture, behind your religion. I've been told this, I don't, you know, I've been misled. You can't judge me. That's probably why Yahweh is making this personal. It's now a one on one, and it's now your personal choice what you're going to do. It's not, 
Uh, my pastor told me this, or my religion told me that. I was deceived. He's going to give the blatant truth to you, and you have to choose. Yeah. So just to recap what I said earlier on, we had the two kings, the two wars. We have the scene of the judges um, in the midst of conflict. And then we have had um, Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim in the previous Torah portion. And we're going to have Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim in the next Torah portion. So we've got a beautiful menorah pattern playing out amongst these four Torah portions. And right in the center, basically, we find these 72 commandments, um, which is packaged within the time frame of the seventh millennium, which is the pinnacle of the whole work of Mashiach. If you look at the seven day creation, he rested on day seven. On the seventh millennium, the last war after that, he will rest. All the conflict will be over, the whole creation, the whole restoration, recreation. And cleansing will be done after the second war. And we follow the same creative cycle. And then day eight begins, which is day one of the next cycle, which is the last, largest cycle, which is to come. Very excited about it all. Yeah. <coughs> well, we don't yes. know the, for example, what we've, we've all seen that the horrific scenes of what's happened in Afghanistan. And we're not seeing we're not seeing the full picture here. As we just imagine what it's like for Christians living in Afghanistan at the moment. But there's a whole lot of repercussions that will flow worldwide from this this whole thing. Um, it's going to stir up a whole lot of uh, uh, terrorist ter I think terrorist activity around the world. It's going to destabilize even more the the whole Middle Eastern. Area, so you've got no idea what the flow on is going to be. If you look at the um, events of the first and second world wars, how easily things can just you know get out of control. We are in, we're in very interesting times at the moment. Yeah, all I can say is don't fear, be strong, be strong. <laughs> Face, listen to what Yahweh says, and repeat those words. That's strong, be strong, and be strengthened. Yeah, this is a song. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I hope that was encouraging. It's very applicable for the times that we're in. And I'm yet again amazed by this how in sync the parasha is with the times that we're living in. Isn't that? Yeah. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. We also see the prophetic layer is also playing out historically. Mm -hmm. It's playing out in our current situation this year. And then past history, it also played out. So, yeah, multi layers of truth mm -hmm. aligning. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh. Um, <laughs> we're, we're having snacks we're, without we're, you. <laughs> we put our snacks on the table. <laughs> Would you like one? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh. oh, we still miss you guys. Oh, yeah, we miss everyone. Oh, too. it's Will. Hello, Will. Hello. Well. <laughs> no, it's not Tony. It's that's Jeff. your fun. And Joan looks like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to get it over the screen. Mm. It's intimidating having the screen because we, yeah. we don't want to ask all your questions and things. Yeah. Why? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so, yourself, Stefan. Ask you stuff. 
I said unmute yourself. So hi to everyone. There we go. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm not alone anymore. Look. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. We just moved house. Oh, it's a nice one. Yeah. Oh, it's a little shot. It's a little camera. Uh, any comments or questions from Adelaide? Any questions? Anyone? We just miss you guys. Yeah. <laughs> we miss no, you. it won't be long. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's been too long. <laughs> it's been too long, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I find the concept of the judges rising up interesting. Mm. Is that, that's, uh, you know, that you said that in this time the, the judges will arise and will have to be discerning to know the fake ones from the real mm. ones. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 All right, so shall I wrap it up? Yeah, yeah. yeah good one. Thank yeah. you, Philip. I'll just close in prayer. Yeah. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have to discuss your word and to connect and um, share your wisdom that's coming from your Torah. Thank you, Father, for giving us your word and help us to understand your word, help us to relate to it, to see where we're at, and then get some inspiration and some advice from you on how to deal with the things that we're currently facing. I thank you that we are not alone. You are looking after us. You are watching us. And you are our commander, Yeshua, who is fighting a fierce battle at this moment in the spiritual. As it rages, we see the manifestation in our physical. And we just want to support you the best we can. Give us words to speak, help us, and give us a vision on, on, on what we need to see so that we can understand and help to, to overcome the enemy in our areas that we are in. I thank you for it all. In the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. 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 Still, still recording there. Oh, hello. I am. Uh...